All right, well, hello and welcome back to our second part here. We just ended with a discussion of allopatric and sympatric speciation, you know, the creation of different species, either uh, due to a physical barrier that separates them or some other uh, barrier that um, restricts uh, gene flow within populations. Now, looking at the effects of uh, this isolation, it can create an interesting situation, uh, which is referred to as a, a hybrid zone. Now. If you have an original population where there's steady gene flow, uh, it is possible, again, to have some sort of barrier preventing these two populations from uh, breeding with one another. Now, over time, uh, changes between these populations will accumulate, certainly. Now, there are opportunities, though, um, where individuals from each of these separate populations may have the uh, ability to uh, breed with one another. Now this can be met with very uh, success. Sometimes uh, hybrid species uh, can do uh, particularly well. Again, given plants, plants uh, handle hybridization quite well. Uh, but some uh, organisms don't do particularly well. That said, um, one of three scenarios can occur if these uh, hybrid zones uh, come into play. Now the first uh, potential impact could be what's called reinforcement. Uh, the idea being the barriers between the two are maintained. Hybrid individuals do uh, poorly in relation to uh, the separate populations. And over time, uh, the hybrids become fewer and fewer in number as the two separate populations uh, evolve in different directions. And again, this ultimately will lead to um, speciation, complete speciation. Now, if barriers, uh, be they uh, geographic or otherwise, begin to diminish and the hybrids uh, do particularly well, uh, then, I'm sorry, as the barriers diminish, then the two uh, separated populations can begin to interbreed more and more frequently until they, again, sort of fuse back into one uh, original population. And that's what we look at with fusion. Finally, uh, we have stability where you have uh, a relatively uh, unchanging um, relationship between the two separated species and the survivorship of the hybrids. You have the distinct uh, groups that are created and these uh, distinct hybrids that are able to survive in their own particular situations uh, as well. Now an interesting um, application of this uh, are these um, hybrid sharks that were uh, reported on just a, a few weeks ago, I guess early January. Um, given uh, climate change that has occurred uh, over in recent decades, uh, ocean temperatures have begun to uh, alter or be altered. And uh, along the east coast uh, of Australia, they've found that uh, two different species of shark separated by uh, the temperature of water in which they swim uh, have, begin to, have begun to commingle and actually produce uh, a hybrid shark. So uh, these hybrid sharks uh, are showing up uh, in these waters, indicating that um, there is uh, potentially a fusion that's going on um, or that could occur uh, between these two separate species uh, should uh, they be able to you know, have overlapping territories. So again, sort of interesting scenarios that can play out uh, in terms of changes that occur in populations. Now, how do we see uh, speciation occurring uh, in nature and in labs. And there are lots of different ways we can observe this. Uh, you have these tiny little squirrels uh, that live on uh, either side of uh, the Grand Canyon. They got a major geographic barrier, so they've been separated for you know, millions of years and uh, have been uh, restricted or had their gene flow restricted. Uh, let's see, when the landmass in Panama uh, was formed, uh, you effectively separated uh, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Uh, and that separated populations of uh, shrimp. So now you have uh, these related shrimp species that have evolved in different ways uh, given different environments on either side of the uh, uh, country in Panama. Uh, your book had an interesting um, depiction of the hybrid zone for the yellow-bellied and fire-bellied uh, toads that you see here. Uh, along the line in Europe, I mean, it's maybe a couple thousand miles long, or roughly, uh, but it's only maybe five or six miles wide. You have this hybrid zone uh, where the frogs are able to hybridize. Otherwise, you have uh, the fire-bellied alleles uh, completely. It's 100%. It's fixed at 100% on uh, one side of the zone, and then the yellow-bellied 
uh, toads on the other side uh, of the zone. Uh, let's see. Uh, additionally, with uh, climate change, you're able to see shifts in uh, populations and then the uh, creation of gene flow uh, between uh, polar bears uh, and grizzly bears. So, you know, we're given our ability to sort of explore and observe organisms around the world, we're seeing these changes occur. Uh, Madeira, these, this uh, particular island, uh, has some mountainous regions, so there's a, a geographic barrier that separates these mouse populations. And over time, uh, chromosomal changes have occurred uh, between these two populations. So now uh, they have uh, you know, distinct uh, genes that separate uh, these populations. Uh, let's see, much of the food we eat, or the plants uh, we eat, I should say, are actually uh, hybridized uh, organisms. Plants can tolerate uh, hybridization uh, relatively well, uh, so as a result of that, you can end up with these polyploid organisms uh, that have traits of uh, different ancestor plants. So, you know, if you had some bread with lunch today, uh, it likely came from uh, this wheat species that uh, is actually a hybrid containing uh, chromosomes from uh, various ancestor species. So here you see how the chromosome number has increased over time uh, in these polyploid plants. So we get you know new traits like uh, larger uh, seeds are created, you know more vigorous growth, uh, greater resistance to certain types of disease, features like that. Uh, let's see. Oh, this monkey flower uh, is interesting as well because it shows how um, other organisms can impact uh, reproduction and populations. Uh, pollinators obviously aid sexual reproduction in these flowers. Um, as pollinators move from flower to flower, they help fertilize um, the species. And it happens that uh, different pollinators prefer different colored flowers. Uh, I believe bumblebees prefer the red flowers and maybe hummingbirds prefer the pink flowers. So uh, since bumblebees are going to be pollinating just red flowers, it helps restrict gene flow uh, between the red flowered plants and the uh, pink flowered plants. Uh, let's see, we can skip over some of these. Oh, this was a nice example as well, uh, talking about how we can sort of induce some of these changes uh, even in lab. So what they did was they took uh, an original uh, fly population and grew them on different media, uh, whether it's a starch-based medium or a, a maltose-based uh, medium. And what they uh, recognize is after uh, a number of generations, there was a clear preference uh, in mating for organisms that were from or raised on the same type of medium. So uh, again, it shows evidence of how you can induce uh, restrictions on gene flow or, or you can induce mate preference uh, in populations. And we see that where uh, starch and maltose uh, individuals you know, raised in the same medium have preference over one another uh, compared to individuals raised on different media. And there you see in the control population that, you know, rates of uh, mating, uh, again, are relatively high for members that uh, grew up or were raised uh, on the same medium or from the same medium. Uh, let's see. Oh, these African cichlids uh, in Lake Victoria are also interesting. This shows an example of how sexual selection can influence um, uh, the separation or the restriction of gene flow between populations. Uh, with sexual selection, typically it's females that get to pick males based on certain characteristics. And uh, in uh, Lake Victoria, you have these separate um, cichlid species, these tiny little fish, and uh, males have these distinct color patterns, and uh, it's females that choose males of one particular color pattern. Now, what they've found is that uh, as pollution in the lake has increased and the uh, waters have been muddied, uh, it's more and more difficult for females to distinguish uh, males of different color, so they're actually starting to see some fusion uh, between uh, the various species uh, occurring. Additionally, they were able to do this experimentally in a lab uh, where uh, under different light, uh, males of the different species uh, look similar to one another, so females couldn't visually uh, tell uh, or distinguish uh, colors between the males. And what they found is that females have no mate preference if they can't tell the color difference. But again, if under normal light, uh, males are shown, uh, females have particular color preference. So it shows how sexual selection can help restrict uh, gene flow between populations. Pretty interesting. 
Uh, let's see. And finally, oh, this is uh, from a study done uh, by researchers at IU. Uh, they looked at uh, hybridization that has occurred uh, between uh, various species or different species uh, in the wild. So uh, you can uh, see this uh, in the wild and then experimentally they're able to look at uh, the changes in chromosomes uh, that result in uh, these hybrid organisms. So we can induce hybridization uh, in lab. We can induce sexual selection uh, in lab. You see examples of this uh, in nature. So we see mechanisms that occur to uh, cause uh, speciation in populations. So we see this happen all the time. Now, uh, the final sort of important question that we get to is, at what rate does this speciation uh, occur? Now, the traditional thought uh, focuses on uh, gradualism. Uh, the idea being that over time you have these changes that occur in the environment, and as a result you see these steady changes that occur uh, in the evolution of new species. Interesting. Fair enough. You see some evidence of this uh, in the fossil record where you see a slow, steady, progressive change uh, in features. Now, uh, a more uh, current uh, conceptualization of this is uh, what's referred to as punctuated equilibrium. Uh, that was devised by Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge. Uh, now, the idea being that for long periods of time, species may not exhibit any sort of uh, major evolutionary advancements, but uh, over, you know, ge geologically short periods of time, you know, 100,000 years, half a million years, you see these new uh, species that are created. Now the question becomes, well, which of those is correct? Which of those is most uh, descriptive? And the answer is both have their own merit. Um, keep in mind, it's the environment that drives evolution of populations. So if you have relative uh, periods of stability, there is not uh, this sort of natural selection that drives species to change significantly. But if you have periods of rapid environmental change, then that can help uh, drive this more uh, punctuated uh, equilibrium uh, evolutionary change that we uh, see. So really, um, the idea is evolutionary change is dictated by changes in the environment and rapid changes in the environment or significant changes in the environment lead to more rapid change uh, as evidenced in the fossil record. Uh, let's see. Well, there we go. We have explanation of that. Sorry. So again, each has its own place uh, based on uh, environmental changes that occur. All right, so big ideas. Uh, again, make sure you're comfortable with allopatric and sympatric uh, speciation. Uh, have ideas, general ideas, of the various barriers that can reduce uh, gene flow. And um, be familiar with the ideas of gradualism and its uh, relationship to the concept of punctuated equilibrium. Questions? Please let me know. Uh, Shoot me an email, give me a call uh, at school, ask a question on Facebook, whatever you need to do. Well, uh, good luck uh, with your studying. I hope everyone has a, a pleasant uh, weekend and does well on the uh, upcoming test.